Burkina Faso's military has taken power in a coup just weeks before an election, but it's not the first African country to experience a military takeover. So why are coups so common in some parts of Africa and what can governments do to stop them? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. When Burkina Faso's military intervened to overthrow longtime President Blaise Compare last October, it was seen by some as a good coup. Compare was about to try and extend his 27-year rule, and the people had said they'd had enough. But almost a year later, and in a sign of just how fragile the political process is, the presidential guard, still loyal to Compare, conducted another coup. It arrested the interim president and prime minister and dissolved the parliament. This all just a few weeks before elections that were meant to put Burkina Faso back on the road to democracy. Now, of course, Burkina Faso is not an exception in Africa. The continent has seen at least 200 successful or failed coups since the 1960s. Some thought it had begun to shake off its reputation for military takeovers. But in just the last five years, there have been coups in Niger, as well as Mali and Guinea-Bissau in 2012, and Central African Republic a year later. There was also an attempted coup in Gambia last year and in Burundi earlier this year. So why do military takeovers seem so common in Africa? Let's bring in our guests for today's Inside Story. In Pretoria, South Africa, we have David Zumeu, senior researcher at the South African Institute for Security Studies. In London, Gabriel Leon, lecturer in political economy at King's College London. Gabriel specializes in military coups and their causes. And in Paris, France, we have Cynthia O'Hayan, West Africa analyst for the International Crisis Group. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being with us on Inside Story today. If I can start with you, David, in uh, South Africa, a very confusing political situation in uh, Burkina Faso today. But the turn of events are, are not surprising at all, are they? This was predictable. And uh, no, definitely this was productive. Or I will even say this is of uh, the act two of what began uh, last year when Compari was uh, compared to uh, a Sikh exile in uh, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. We see how quick the military uh, element move to recuperate the the process. As uh, we see how uh, Yakuba Zida, who was the number two of the presidential guard, was a uh, propel before the scene to take control of the transition before the international pressure forced him to back down and to allow uh, Kafando to become a civilian president to lead mm. the, the, the transition. But uh, the response of the military comes as, uh, as a resistance to some of the reforms that the traditional government was putting in place that will ultimately weaken the capacity of the military forces in Burkina Faso so, to remain control of the political process. So you're saying that the military felt threatened. Uh, Cynthia, in Paris, the, the presidential mm. guard unit that uh, uh, dissolved the, the transitional government uh, was formed under President Blaise Compaoré. Do you think he has a hand in the events of the last few hours in Burkina Faso? Well, I mean, this is um, a very hard question to answer, and I don't think we can provide a clear answer. Um, I'm not sure that he would be directly involved in what is going on, um, but what he's sure is that his uh, entourage, uh, his associates, including those that are still in Ouagadougou, um, are obviously playing a, a role in this. Um, I think, yeah, there is a kind of collusion between at least a segment of the CDP, which is the former ruling party, and the RSP, um, you know, to, to get together and preserve their interests, their common interests. Gabriel, do you think uh, the events in Burkina Faso, the events that we've seen in the last few hours, are similar to what happened last year, the popular revolt that led to the ouster of the former president, uh, Blaise Compaoré? Are we in a similar situation, in your opinion? No, I don't think so. I think what's happened is that you have a presidential guard that about a year ago was very powerful, had a lot of perks and enjoyed a lot of benefits, and they're basically being threatened with disbandment. So essentially, I think they're just reacting to the existential threat that they're facing because, I mean, the truth is that the next democratic government that would have been elected in October would probably have gotten rid of the presidential guard. Mm. So I think they're acting essentially in defense of their own interests. You, you speak of an existential threat uh, that they felt uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, uh, Gabriel. 
of course, every coup d'etat has different origins, causes and effects. What are the underlying causes in uh, most cases when uh, you talk about Burkina Faso, Mali and so on? What are the motivations for the army to take power? In general, one of the most striking commonalities across coups is that they have to do with the basically military protecting its own corporate interest. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the data, going back to the 1960s actually, one of the things that is quite striking is that when a government decreases the amount of money that is being allocated to the military, the probability of that government being overthrown in a coup increases considerably. I think in that way what's happened uh, in Burkina Faso now is essentially just another instance of that. The military is basically facing uh, some threats to its own interests and it's reacting to that threat. Mm. So I think there, is, you know, there, there are a lot of commonalities with a lot of other coups in Africa. David, what about the idea that the military also in, in uh, some cases takes over because they represent the people's concern? Is that the case in Burkina Faso or can you give us an example where that's been the case, the military took over because the people wanted them uh, to step in? Yes, uh, definitely the involvement of military in politics has never been a good thing for, for the continent. It's always led to disaster, uh, be it a good or, or bad. But at a certain point where civilian presidents behave themselves to compromise the political process or compromise the stability of the country, a military institution becomes almost a safeguard for the preservation of what has been there. We look at the Niger in 2010, the intervention of the military to stop Mamadou Tanja from amending the constitution and drag his country into instability was seen as a good coup because mm. after the coup, I think the military officers surrendered the power to a civilian government, organized the transition and this was not the first time this had happened. In 1999, the army in Niger also intervened to the extent that that army in Niger has gained a reputation of the rest of the one who restores, which restores a democratic experiment in, uh, in, in Niger. But elsewhere, in the case of Burkina Faso, the army has always been one, the backbone of the political oppression under President uh, Kumpaori for almost 30 years and has not really accepted the fact that uh, popular upheaval managed to uh, really chase Kumpaori out of power mm -hmm. and now facing the threat of uh, dismissal by the authorities of the traditional government, they think they need to react to protect their own interests. So we have two cases where the army intervened to defend its peculiar interests, while in the, in the other case of Niger, we see the army intervening to make sure that the democratic credentials of Niger remain on track. Do you agree, Cynthia, with David when he says that in Burkina Faso today that the army, this is essentially what he said, the army doesn't really represent uh, the people's concerns? I mean, what's the relationship between the military and the people who took to the streets last year uh, to demand the ouster of Blaise Compaoré? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is at the moment, I mean, the military that is uh, taking over the country does not have popular support. Quite the contrary, the people are mobilizing or at least trying to mobilize uh, to counter uh, the coup. Um, and what happened last year is that the military sort of presented its intervention as helping the interests of the people, but really the, the military and in particular uh, the current Prime Minister Yakuba Isaac Zida, who was the uh, second in command of the RSP, uh, he was put in power uh, by the former regime to make sure that someone was in power to preserve their interests. So really, I mean, and then he kind of colluded with some segments of civil society uh, to pretend that he was going to safeguard the uprising. Um, and then he emancipated himself. But really, when the army took over uh, in October of last year, mm. um, it was really to preserve the interest, its own interests and the interests of the former regime. Mm. And that's what it's doing again now. We've heard that labor unions, Cynthia, in Burkina Faso and civil society organizations such as uh, Le Ballet Citoyen uh, call for general protests and a strike. Do you think they'll be able to gather this time around? Will they be able to take to the streets like they did last year? I think, I mean, I think the military um, and the RSP and the, those who are organizing the coup, I think they were very well prepared for this. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a reaction from civil society that is uh, that was to be expected. And um, I'm hearing that the RSP is patrolling uh, Ouagadougou and they are trying to disperse uh, demonstrators. 
Um, so to be honest, I am not sure that people will be able to mobilize uh, in, in, uh, in great numbers um, and they might be uh, simply scared uh, to, to get to the streets. I mean, I know that people, leaders from civil society and even from political parties are very mobilized mm. and some, some of them are not afraid to, um, to go down to the streets. But I am not sure that they will be able to gather uh, great numbers so, so as to put enough pressure so the, on the RSP. So the context is uh, very different uh, this time around than you say. Gabriel, I want to get your opinion on a point that David made just a, a second ago. He talked about a good coup. My question is, what makes a coup a good coup? And, you know, in opposition, what makes it a bad coup? Yes, I, th I think that's a very good point. Um, you need to think about who is being overthrown and who comes afterwards. So if you have a coup that removes from power a dictator who's not very good to you know, his population and then leads to a process that will conclude in democracy, I think that would be considered a good coup. Mm -hmm. A coup, on the other hand, that is against the democracy and then you end up with a dictatorship, that would be a bad coup. And I think the thing to bear in mind is that when you have a dictator who's quite powerful, it's very difficult to remove that person from office in any way other than through a coup. So when we hear today condemnation from the United Nations, from France, a condemnation uh, at the events that are happening in Burkina Faso, uh, and when you compare that to the reaction last year, which was a bit more, um, they were, if not applauding what happened in Burkina Faso, they certainly weren't condemning it. Uh, how, how, do we, how do you explain this uh, difference in reaction from the international community? Well, I, th I think the difference is explained by the fact that we view democracy as sort of the ideal political system, and for very good reasons. And I think the coup last year was seen as a step, or a necessary step perhaps, in the direction of democracy. And I think the elections that were going to happen in a few weeks' time was sort of a next step in that trajectory towards democracy. And what's happened now is that the coup that we've had uh, is actually pushing us out of that trajectory or away from that trajectory. So it's actually pushing us in the opposite direction of where we think uh, the country should be traveling. Uh, David, in, in Pretoria, I, I want to ask you about the reaction of uh, the regional bodies, uh, the African Union, the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS. I think uh, the, the, the reaction has come on a very, uh, it was timely. I think since this morning, I think the, the three organizations, ECOWAS, the African Union and the UN, have issued the joint communique mm -hmm. condemning what was happening in Burkina Faso. And after the proclamation of uh, 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 what they said is a new republic, the African Union issued immediate communique, said that everything happening, or every decision taking the military junta will not be considered. Mm -hmm. And then the next step from the African Union and ECOWAS will be how to see to impose a sanction on those who are now ruining the hope of, of a democratic of the completion of the transition in Burkina Faso because the elections are only planned to take place in three weeks and the campaign was supposed to start on, on Saturday. So this came to disrupt of the effort that the AU, ECOWAS, and the UN, as well as the European Union, put into uh, the transition of Burkina Faso to see Burkina Faso return to political normalcy. And I think the reaction so far is appreciated uh, for the kind of a tough lang language that all those organizations have adopted so far. But there is also a door to engage those who are in power to see how to uh, take into consideration some of the grievances that might have left them to put a stop to the transition in Burkina Faso. Mm. Now, I want get your view on another aspect now. An increasing number of African leaders are trying to defy constitutional limits on their time in office. It's what some are calling third termism. Now, since the year 2000, 15 African leaders have tried to remain in power by changing their constitutions. Burundi's president, Pierre Nkurunziza, is the most recent. He was re-elected in July despite weeks of protests and a constitutional limit of two terms in office. Others to watch are the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville and Rwanda, all kinds countries whose leaders are suspected of wanting to run for a third term. Uh, Gabriel, I, I want to get your view on this. Uh, do you think these maneuvers to stay in, in power could be considered a, a form of coup as well? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call it a form of coup because I think when we think of coups, we generally think that the military needs to be involved. But I think the, again, sort of very concerning um, 
developments because, again, they push you away from that trajectory that is meant to take you towards democracy. Mm. I think it's something, actually, there's, there's a very interesting parallels with Latin America. Latin America experienced something quite similar uh, back in sort of late 1990s and early 2000s where you had all of these democratically elected presidents actually extending the terms. So they were becoming presidents for life, uh, which in a way was kind of sort of undermining the spirit of democracy. And I think in a way that's what's currently happening in Africa. Mm. Uh, Cynthia in Paris, what about the foreign influences, uh, you know, the, the former colonial powers like France, for instance? What role can they play in reducing uh, the risk of coups in, in African countries, in uh, perhaps convincing these leaders not to run for a third term. Is there still, uh, do you think there's uh, still a, a possibility that these former colonial powers can influence what's happening on the African continent? They have an important role to play, indeed. Um, the most important leverage that they have, especially in the case of Burkina Faso, is um, international aid. Um, Burkina Faso is very dependent on international aid. Uh, basically, the state cannot function or cannot function properly without aid. Um, and I mean, I think this um, stick worked uh, pretty well last year. There was a lot of international pressure when uh, Lieutenant Colonel Zida seized power. Mm. There was a lot of pressure that eventually made him um, give power back to a civilian to lead the transition. Um, so I think this is one card that the international community has to play. Uh, and, and hopefully they will play this card and this will, uh, you know, have an impact in the negotiations that will have to um, start at some point uh, to find a way out of the, the situation. Um, but the sure thing is that the foreign players also have their, their own interests to right. preserve right. and Burkina Faso is in a very strategic location. Uh, so that also, um, you know, comes into uh, consideration. Uh, David, uh, sh she made an interesting point there, uh, Cynthia, uh, when she said that foreign powers have interests in these countries. Does that mean that some of these foreign powers, like France, for instance, have also had a hand in what's happened uh, in these military coups? Look, if you look at it from the 1960s, definitely France has made and uh, unmade, so to speak, regimes in Africa, including Burkina Faso. When they are not happy with uh, the regime that is in place, it's definitely behind the scene, work out to topple that government. But the things have changed a little bit uh, since the democratization process, when some social forces, civil society organizations, and activists have taken control of uh, the, the political process even though in Burkina Faso has been extremely difficult, mm -hmm. we have seen a very important activities carried out by civil society organization that has helped Bless Kumpaori to relinquish control over, over some element of power and uh, respect, show some kind of respect to human rights. Mm -hmm. Of course, his regime is still involved with some uh, assassination, uh, including Nobel Zongo, right. but also the unresolved case of, of Thomas Sankara, for which justice has never been rendered. So foreign influence can work both ways to maintain a regime that is favorable to them, but also to stop the one that want to hang on to power against the interests of a citizen. You uh, uh, talked about France and Blaise Compaoré. Uh, Blaise Compaoré, of course, uh, for a long time was supported by the, the former colonial power, France. Uh, Gabriel, in uh, London, do you agree with David when he f says that things have changed, that uh, the foreign influence isn't as strong today as it was uh, in, in the past? Yes, I agree. I, th I think a lot of the foreign influence in the past was motivated by the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So after 1989, the foreign powers had less of an incentive to intervene. And actually, I would, I would personally be quite wary of suggesting that foreign powers should get involved in some of these issues, because I think that when the military intervenes, they often uh, try to find reasons for doing so. And there's no reason that comes easier than saying, oh, well, the opposition is being supported by a foreign power, and us as the military have to look after the interest of you know, our nation. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that international involvement in these negotiations uh, has to be done very carefully. Mm. But there was a time when, you know, just uh, in, in the last few years, there was hope that, you know, this was over. 
that uh, we wouldn't see as many military coups uh, in Africa, on the African continent, not as many certainly as in the 1980s and early 90s. But it seemed to have picked up again in just the last five years. How do you explain this, Gabriel? Well, I mean, I, I think the economic crisis probably has a lot to do with it, because going back to the idea that the military actually looks after its own interests, mm. when the economy is not doing very well, the government has less money to give out, which means less money is going to the military. And then the military gets upset and then tries to um, overthrow the government. And by taking control of the government, then they have control over the whole pie. And I think, you know, I think that's one of the reasons. And the second reason has to do with uh, so the war on terror, which I think um, has now become sort of more relevant in Africa over the last few years, which mm -hmm. means that the military is again playing a more prominent role in politics, sure. which, you know, makes them perhaps think, well, you know, this is our chance to take over. So, Cynthia, what do you think then could deter these schools? I mean, do you think more government spending on the military could help deter these schools? Well, I mean, I think that in the long term, at some point, the governments will have to find ways to rein in the military. I mean, in Burkina Faso, for example, it's a characteristic of, of its political history that the military had, has always intervened whenever there was a problem between politician, uh, civilian politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, in the long term, ideally, uh, we should be able to you know, make sure that the military stays with the barracks and to dissociate uh, uh, military issues and political issues. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure that just increasing spending uh, just to make uh, military soldiers happy mm. is, um, is a solution. But I think this is an issue that is demilitarizing political life, for example, in Burkina Faso is an issue that is going to uh, to take some time. And I mean, you would yeah. think that uh, an old style coup like what is happening right now is, is not possible anymore um, because of all the international pressure, but clearly it's still uh, it's still possible. So, so there's still a lot of challenges. Do you agree with uh, uh, Cynthia, David in Pretoria that it, there's a, a long way to go before we see less of these military coups in Africa? And also, what do you think can effectively uh, be done to reduce the risk of coups in these countries? No, definitely. I think if you look at it, you mentioned it in the introduction from uh, 1960s up to 2000. We recall that almost, uh, uh, according to the statistic that I used recently in the paper, uh, almost 80 coups, successful coups, I mean. And uh, from 2000, we have eight. So you have now, if you add Burkina Faso, 89 successful coups that have taken place. But if you look at over the past 10 years, mm. probably because of a normative framework that has been established by the African Union uh, in its African Charter, and democracy and good governance, the Article 24 and to 26 made it clear it's difficult for a coup to be successful in Africa or coup leaders to hang on to power. They are allowed, they're not allowed to even lead the, 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 the transition. And that has recorded some success. With ECOWAS as well, you look at the protocol, mm -hmm. uh, the 2001 additional protocol on democracy and good governance, they have been very specific in limiting or making life difficult okay. for, 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 for coup makers. Uh, Sanogo in Mali and uh, that this camera in, uh, in, in Guinea, Guinea Conakry yeah. could not really survive the international pressure. So these are in Guinea. So these are some of the elements in, in addition to the effort by civil society to hold government accountable and to force them to make sure that democracy is, is implemented and the institutions are sure. consolidated okay. to really deprive the military from the argument that they generally use to search coups. Uh, Gabriel, you have the last word. What do you think can be done to reduce the risk of coups in some parts of Africa. Well, I mean, I agree with David. I think building civil society is the way to go. And the reason for that is that in many African countries, when you go back 10, 20 years, the military was actually the one organization that could coordinate and act in a sort of organized manner. Mm -hmm. And I think creating other types of organizations that can function in a similar way and in a way act as a balancing power to the military is the way to go. OK, thank you very much. We'll leave it on that. Thank you so much for an interesting discussion. Uh, David Zumeu, Gabriel Leon and Cynthia O'Hayan.
Thank you very much for watching as well. As always, you can contact us by going to our program page on our website, aljazeera.com. You can also leave a comment on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.